Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, I'm going to continue in the study of the book of Job, and uh, I'll start with chapter 26 and see how far I can get tonight in an hour. Uh, if you have not seen the previous uh, studies on this, I, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning, starting with chapter 1. Chapter 1 and 2 lays the groundwork that is so important to understand, and I'll, I'll kind of give you a synopsis of it now. That See, it starts off where um, Satan says he's traveled around the world. He can't find any good man. Nobody loves God. And, and uh, God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? He's, a, he's righteous. And uh, Satan t says, well, he, he only loves you because you've blessed him so much. He's, he's got everything. He, he's rich. He's got a great family. He's healthy. He says, let me take these things away from him and, you, and he'll curse you. He, 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 won't, he only loves you because you bless him. And so God gives Satan permission to do that. Now, the important thing to understand is it is not God that is afflicting Job. And it's also important to, to understand that Job is not being afflicted because he's a sinner and it's some kind of a retribution from God. However, as um, after all these bad things happen to Job, he, he loses his, his whole, his family's killed, his uh, wealth is destroyed, his health is ruined, he's got horrible boils on his body from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. He's in horrible pain and suffering with, and he really wants to die. He just, he suffered so much. Uh, but Job has three people come to visit him that are supposed to be his friends. Uh, I call them Job's so-called friends because with friends like that, you don't need any enemies. Instead of consoling Job and helping him get through this, uh, they're just pointing the finger at him and condemning him. So for probably the last four or five or six chapters, maybe more, uh, it's been a chapter where w one of Job's, Job's so-called friends uh, accuses him. It, and he makes a long speech that covers the entire chapter. And he's, he's saying, Job, you're getting everything you deserve because you're a sinner, you're wicked. And God's doing this to you for that reason. If you just will repent, plead to God, Maybe he'll forgive you and accept you back and bless you again. That's what his so-called friends are keep on telling him. And they're making these long, eloquent speeches. And then the next chapter is Job giving his speech, which is an answer to his friends' uh, accusations. So it's been going back and forth like that between Job and his friends now for many chapters. And we're going to continue. But I, this, I'm going to try to go through the remainder of these arguments between Job and his friends uh, more quickly now. Uh, because we, we, we do understand this basic problem. Job, Job's friends don't understand what's really going on. In fact, Job doesn't even understand what's really going on. Uh, Job thinks it is God that's afflicting him. And Job doesn't understand why, because he doesn't feel he's guilty, that he, he doesn't deserve it. Uh, but uh, So he's trying to defend himself from his uh, friend's accusations, and that is going back and forth. Now I'll pick this up in chapter 26. I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it in the KJV first, and then I probably will go through it more slowly and carefully looking at the Amplified, because the Amplified is like a commentary. It, it, it uh, amplifies it. So <clears throat> chapter 26, Job is answering the last chapter, the last speech by his friend. <clears throat> but Job answered and said, How hast thou helped him that is without power? How savest thou the arm that hath no strength? How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? And how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? To whom hast thou uttered words? And whose spirit came from thee? Dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Hell is naked before him and destruction hath no covering. He stretched out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. 
he bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divided the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Well, my first uh, reaction to that is uh, that uh, I believe that um, as we get chapter 26, maybe beyond, there's going to be some uh, really good verses here to support creationism. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I know our brother Nephilim Free, brother Evan, uh, you know, he was anxious to uh, uh, get to those chapters. He joined me for once or twice in the study, and he'd probably be delighted to explain some of this. I'll do the best I can to go over it, but uh, some of these verses stick out to me as uh, crying out for creationism. Uh, let me look at this in the uh, Amplified, and I'll go through it one verse at a time. Okay, the, I've said this many times, but I, I know that some people will watch a single video out of context. And they don't have the benefit of watching it from the beginning and get the full context. And there are some things I have to repeat over and over again. But when I read the Amplified Translation, it has titles. And the title for this chapter is Job Rebukes Bildad. Bildad is one of the three friends that just finished rebuking and accusing uh, Job. So this is Job's rebuke or answer back to Bildad. Uh, but the titles that we see in the Amplified or in uh, many translations, even the KJV has titles for books and it has uh, chapter numbers and verse numbers and punctuation and all these things were added by the publishers or, or and translators. They were not part of the original manuscripts. Of course, we don't have the original manuscripts, but we have we have copies of copies of copies. Some, some of them are pretty, pretty gener generationally pretty close to the originals. But uh, we don't have the original manuscripts. But we have enough that uh, I, I'm very confident in the truth of the scriptures. I trust them completely. But um, that's why when we look at the, uh, uh, the, the chapter title, and sometimes they put, titles within a chapter, like subtitles for particular paragraphs, to tell you what the translator thinks that, that is the, kind of the, uh, would be the title for that particular portion, the main point that's being made. Uh, but those things can be helpful, they can be interesting, but they were put there by men, and uh, even though some of these men were probably very scholarly, and maybe they, maybe the title is appropriate and correct, but let's not trust it in the same way that we would trust the scriptures themselves. So in the Amplified, chapter 26, his, his title is Job Rebukes Bildad. It says, but Job answered and said, what a help you are to the weak powerless. That's sarcasm, by the way, because Bildad and Eliphaz and the other one, they, they're not helpful to Job at all. All they're doing is, is just you know, making the situation worse because, first of all, they don't know what they're talking about. They're completely wrong about the, evaluating what's, what's happening. Uh, and that's really no way to help your friend anyway get through a crisis. Um, so he says, what a help you are to the weak and powerless. In other words, Job is weak and powerless. He's just totally just crushed from everything that's happened to him. And he says, what a help you are, sarcastically how you have saved the arm that is without strength. 
how you have counseled the one who has no wisdom. In other words, uh, they keep on acting like they're the wise ones and Job, Job is like ignorant. Um, one of the things that I've found interesting uh, that over the years, uh, studying Job, reading Job, never really studying it as I'm doing now, that, that completely, but reading it over the years, it, it never stood out to me. It never stood out to me that the, uh, uh, the, the three friends are actually much older men than Job. I'm guessing that they're probably around, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old, and Job is probably 30 or 40 years old. Uh, we we discussed that in earlier studies to so, so you can see why we came to that conclusion but they think they're older and wiser and job needs instruction uh, so he says how you have counseled the one who has no wisdom that's sarcasm again and how abundantly you have provided sound wisdom and helpful insight more sarcasm from job in other words, he's not really thanking them for counseling him. He's being sarcastic, saying, you haven't been helpful at all. And then verse 4 says, to whom have you uttered these words? And whose spirit inspired what came forth from you? Uh -huh. Yeah, who's behind your words? In other words, Job doesn't believe that God is, is uh, uh, revealing to them anything, and then they are counseling Job. He's saying, who, who's, what spirit is behind what you're doing? I think he suspects that it's evil spirits. Now they have, um, uh, before verse 5, they have a subtitle. And it says, The Greatness of God. So Job's continuing. The spirits of the dead tremble underneath the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol, that's the netherworld, the place of the dead, is naked before God. And Abaddon, the place of destruction, has no covering from his eyes. I think that's pretty simple, self-explanatory there. Uh, I, I have no sense in trying to elaborate any further because it's so, so clear. Uh, verse 7, it is he, and that's capitalized. So, you know, in this translation, they're saying, it is he, it, this is God, it is God who spreads out the north over emptiness and hangs the earth on nothing. Now, this is, a, now, when did Job live? When was Job, the book of Job written? Who wrote Job? We, we speculated on that. Uh, in the very first video of this series. Uh, and there are a, a variety of opinions on that. Uh, but let's just say that this is an ancient book. And uh, if, if it was written um, before David, uh, be, before Isaiah was, I think, 700 years before Jesus, David was a thousand years before J Jesus. And so if this is, was written long before that, at the time of Moses or before that, in, between the flood and Moses, or perhaps before the flood, that's the various schools of thought on that. It was written long time ago, and yet long before telescopes, Long before man was able to circle the Earth with a, and uh, as with astronauts and study things the way we do today, it says right here. It says, "It is God. It is He who spreads out the North over emptiness." That's talking about the vastness and emptiness of the universe and hangs the earth on nothing. Now, isn't that a perfect description? How would anybody know, living at that time on the earth, that it's hanging on nothing? That means that the earth, as we know it, is in space and it's not connected to anything. I mean, there were theories um, in ancient history some people believe that the earth was resting on the shoulders of a giant named Atlas. 
some people thought that, pardon me, <clears throat> some people thought that I think the earth was uh, carried around on the back of a giant turtle. Um, but here in the Bible, long before we had proof that the earth is hanging on nothing, it says right here, the earth hangs and hangs the earth on nothing. That means the earth is just suspended in space. It's only here, uh, nothing, there's no strings holding it up, no poles holding it up. Um, the Bible is full of scientific declarations like that long before uh, we had any scientific evidence of these things. Verse 8 says, He, meaning God, he wraps the waters in his clouds, which otherwise would spill on earth all at once, and the cloud does not burst under them. So, uh, he, he understands and he writes that these clouds are filled with water like a big giant water balloons. Uh, so there's more understanding of these scientific things that than people realize in, even in these ancient times. And this was revealed. This is in the Bible revealed because God gave this knowledge to people. This is... Uh, I don't know if someone taught this to Job or if it's just a revelation he got from God when he, or whoever wrote this. But these are Job's words, according to the scriptures. He says, and the cloud does not burst under them. Verse 9 says, he covers the face of the full moon and spreads his cloud over it. So... This is talking about the, uh, the, how almighty God is, that God can do all these things that are so spectacular, far beyond anyone uh, that uh, man, anything that man could ever imagine to do on his own. Uh, verse 10, he has inscribed a circular limit, the horizon, on the face of the waters, at the boundary between light and darkness. Okay, so uh, he has inscribed a circular limit. That's the horizon. The horizon is circular. A lot of people, they look at the horizon and they think that it's just flat. It appears to be flat to the naked eye. Uh, I don't know if it, with the naked eye, if anybody could even discern that it's round. Uh, but that's what it says right here. And that's, that's obviously a, an indication that the earth is round, not flat. Verse 11, the pillars of the heavens tremble and are terrified at his rebuke. Uh, the, the, the heavens is the, the universe. See, there are, when the Bible says heaven or heavens, uh, it doesn't always mean the same thing. Uh, there are basically three uses of the word heaven or heavens. The, the heavens, as it is right here, is all of creation, the entire universe. That's the heavens. And then we also can have times where the word appears and it should be understood that it's just the atmosphere around the earth. Uh, and then another, of course, definition of heaven is the, the, uh, where the throne of God is. So in this case, when it says, the pillars of the heavens tremble. That just means like the, the whole universe trembles and is terrified at his rebuke. In other words, God, he could just he could just rebuke the universe and just cause destruction of the whole universe. And he will someday. Because the scriptures tell us that uh, uh, the, the universe uh, will, will be burned up with a fervent fire. It'll melt away and God will recreate everything there'll be a new heavens and new earth that's where we'll that's where we'll be living in eternity in the new heaven and new earth uh, those of us who put our faith in jesus and are, are truly christians verse 12 he stirred up the sea by his power 
and by his understanding, he smashed proud Rahab. Let me see if there's a reference, verse 12 there. No, there's not. Oh, yeah, 12. A legendary, uh, verse 12, 26, 12. He stirred up the sea by his power and by his understanding, he smashed proud Rahab. See, it says the footnote here in the Amplified, it says Job 26, 12, such as a legendary and horrifying sea monster. So I, I would think that Rahab would be talking about Rahab the prostitute. And yet, I don't think it could be. This was written, this this whole thing was long before Rahab and, uh, you know, the Israelites and their dealings with, uh, with Rahab. Uh, and then verse 13 says, by his breath, the heavens are cleared. By, but his, his, his hand has pierced the swiftly fleeing serpent. Okay, so that, that's probably an indication back to the previous verse because the notes, the footnotes here think that this proud Rahab is, is, a, is a legendary sea monster. Uh, verse 14, yet these are just the fringes of his ways, mere samples of his power, the faintest whisper of his voice. Who can contemplate the thunder of his full mighty power? That's a good question, isn't it? Who can contemplate the full thunder of his mighty power? Uh, it's, it's really beyond uh, our capacity. Our, you know, they, they, they say that man only uses a small portion of his capacity, of his brain and his mind. And uh, I, I'm sure in eternity that you know, our, our capacity will be much greater. We'll, we'll, we'll have a higher intelligence and we'll have supernatural abilities, but not like God. Uh, we will never be like God in that respect with intelligence. He knows everything. He's omniscient. Uh, he, he can do whatever he wants to do. He's omnipotent. Um, and, and that's something that none of us can even dream of being. We're never going to be omniscient. And the nice thing about it, though, is for, for God to know everything, I'm sorry, Lord. I just don't. I don't understand that. How you, maybe you wouldn't get bored? I, I love learning so much. Every time I learn something that I didn't know, it's exciting. I hope you get that kind of a thrill, excitement, pleasure from learning. But God doesn't learn anything because He knows everything. So in that way, it's, it's it seemed like a sad thing. But I mean, how how am I going to? You know, feel bad for God because he doesn't have the excitement of learning that we get. Uh, he has the excitement of knowing everything. That I must be much greater. Um, but this chapter is talking about the greatness of God, and uh, so uh, no matter what, I think it was Einstein is famous for saying. He's famous for a lot of things, but he said that man doesn't even know 1% of nothing. It's a double negative on purpose, but but he says, uh, we don't know 1% of nothing. So all the people that think that they're, uh, you know, through science and philosophy, man can figure out everything and eventually, well, that's just, we haven't learned that yet. Well, eventually we'll know it. Like in other words, we'll figure everything out eventually. But, uh, we got a long ways to go, according to Einstein. Man doesn't even know 1% of nothing. And yet God knows everything. All right, let me go on to the next chapter. I'll first read it in the, go back to the KJV. Okay. Uh, verse... Oops, I better, chapter 27 says, 
this is Job still still talking in chapter 27. It says, moreover, Job continued his parable and said, as God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment and the almighty who hath vexed my soul? All the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips shall not speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. I believe that's directed to Bildad. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. Let mine enemy be as the wicked and he that riseth up against me as the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained when God taketh away his soul? Will God hear his cry when trouble cometh upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? I will teach you by the hand of God that which is with the Almighty will I not conceal. Behold, all ye yourselves have seen it. Why then are ye thus altogether vain? This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors, which they shall receive of the Almighty. If his children be multiplied, it is for the sword and his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread. Those that remain of him shall be buried in death, and his widows shall not weep. Though he heap up silver as the dust and prepare raiment as the clay, he may prepare it, but the just shall put it on, and the innocent shall divide the silver. He buildeth his house as a moth and as a booth that keeper that the keeper maketh. The rich man shall lie down, but he shall not be gathered. He openeth his eyes, and he is not. Tears take hold on him as waters. A tempest stealeth him away in the night. The east wind carrieth him away, and he departeth. And as a storm hurleth him out of his place. For God shall cast upon him and not spare he would fain flee out of his hand. Men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. Now, in previous chapters, you know, Job's so-called friends have been uh, talking about the, the power of God and, and that how God is... Uh, punishing Job because of his wickedness, and, uh, and 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 now we we see Job boasting in God, in his that God is just that that uh, you know he, he will punish the wicked and and, and um, bless the righteous, and and uh, so this chapter sounds a little bit like what his friends have been telling him his so-called friends. Uh, so they, they all understand the greatness of God. The, the big misunderstanding is his friends think it's God who is afflicting Job. Even Job thinks God is afflicting him. It's To me, that's one of the saddest things about this whole story. And not only is Job suffering so much, but he thinks that God is doing it to him and he doesn't understand why. I mean, imagine being in that situation. He doesn't know it's not God doing it. God is permitting it. But God is not doing it, and he's not doing it to Job to punish him. So let me read this in the Amplified now more slowly. Okay. As I said before, the Amplified has titles for chapters, and uh, 
The title for this chapter is Job Affirms His Righteousness. I wouldn't have, uh, I mean, Job has been affirming his righteousness throughout. He's denied all along that he's done something to deserve these things. Uh, so uh, 27 verse 1 in the Amplified says, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my right and denied my justice, and the Almighty who has caused bitterness and grief for my soul? As long as my life is within me and the breath of God is still in my nostrils, my lips will not speak unjustly, nor will my tongue utter deceit. <clears throat> so, two important things that he's just said is that uh, um, God is doing it, these things to him, but he refuses to uh, speak unjustly and utter deceit. Uh, so that's one of the things, of course, that we learn to admire about Job throughout all of this. Uh, he continues to love God, to praise God, even though he's confused and thinks it's God that's doing it to him. He doesn't understand why. He, he never stops loving God and accepting what God, what's, what's happening to him, even thinking it as God is doing, he accepts it. He's complaining about it, but he, you know, he accepts that God can do whatever he wants because he's God and I'm not. Uh, but he says, my lips will not speak unjustly, nor will I, my tongue utter deceit. Early on, his, his wife told him, uh, after all these bad things happened to him, she was encouraging, just curse God and die. I mean, because he was suffering so much. Can you just like, get it over with this curse God so he can just kill you and then be done with it? And uh, of course, no matter how much suffering, he will not curse God. Verse five says, Far be it from me that I should admit you are right in your accusations against me. That's back to Bildad and Eliphaz. And I can't remember the name of the third one. But they've gone on these diatribes, these long tirades against Job, and it's unjustly pointing the finger and saying he's wicked. Uh, verse 6. I hold fast by uprightness and my right standing with God. That's his righteousness, my uprightness. And I will not let them go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. In other words, he, he, he doesn't feel that he has anything to feel guilty about or ashamed about. That he needs to repent of anything because... Uh, as his friends are saying, it's because of your wickedness, the things you've done, repent of it and, and pray that God will forgive you and, and uh, uh, you know, stop punishing you. But according to Job, he continues to profess his innocence. Now, the, here's a subtitle before verse 7. It says, the state of the godless. So the godless, of course, are those people who don't believe in God or don't have a relationship with God. And uh, So uh, as verse 7 says, May my enemy be as the wicked, and he who rises up against me be as the unrighteous, the unjust. For what is the hope of the godless? Even though he has gained in this world, when God, when God takes his life, That's a good question. Uh, most people, uh, I, I, I'm assuming there's someone that actually believes in God, believes in some kind of afterlife. Now, I know that there is a small percentage of people that don't believe in life after death, and they don't believe God exists, and um, this isn't referencing them, but it, it, I'm talking to those people that believe in a God, and that something exists after we, after we, uh, we die. Uh, 
well, you, you, it's very likely you may not believe in Christianity and in the Christianity that we find in the Bible, biblical Christianity. I'm going to make sure you understand what biblical Christianity is, is before I'm finished. But even if you don't believe in biblical Christianity, if you just believe that someday you die and there's some kind of a judgment in an afterlife, the question is, what's really important? Eternity or the 70 or 80 years you get now is, is you, you want to be so not think about eternity and not try to figure out and understand what you need to do so that your eternity can be wonderful. So many people, they, they just, they don't uh, have it as a priority. It's not an important thing that they hardly think about it. They're thinking about the here and now. They're thinking about the pleasures of this world. But the scripture says that this is not our true home. For those of us who trust Jesus anyway, this is not our true home. It says we are only pilgrims just passing through. 70 years here and eternity later. Yeah, eternity. Securing my place in eternity is what really is important. Uh, so it's very short-sighted for people to not think about hey, what happens after we die. What's the purpose of life? I didn't really try to understand those things or give much thought of it until I was 36 years old. What happened is that my mother died and it was the first loss in my family, the first family member that had passed away. For the first time in my life, I was faced with death and I needed answers. I wanted to know what happens after we die. I, I didn't think about it before because I was thinking about here and now and didn't want to be bothered with uh, theology. And, but when my mother died, that's when I realized I need to find out what happens after we die and what is the purpose of life anyway? That's when I started reading the Bible and that's where I found my answers. But here he's saying, for what is the hope of the godless, even though he has gained in this world when God takes his life? So don't be short-sighted. Don't be just focused on the here and now and not even think about eternity. Eternity is a lot longer than the here and now, the 70 years you're going to get. Verse 9, will God hear his cry when trouble and distress come upon him? That's the person who's godless. And if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior God, then no matter what other belief system you have about God, then you're godless. All the religions of the world are all the same. There's no, not a bit of difference in all the religions. Even Christianity, the way most people see Christianity, all the religions all are believing the same thing. That after you die, God will judge you. And if you are good enough in God's eyes, he'll let you into heaven. And if you're not quite good enough, you end up going to hell. It's, it's based on the merit system. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we cannot merit heaven. We cannot earn it by good behavior. We don't go to heaven because we behaved. We go to heaven because we believed in Jesus Christ. Uh, so all of these uh, belief systems, all the religions of the world, they are godless. It does you no good at all. And it, it, it gives you a false sense of security. If, if, if you have any 
confidence that you're going to go to heaven based upon your personal merit, then it's a, it's a false sense of security because you don't go there based on personal merit. Verse 10, will he take delight in the almighty? Will he call on God at all times? Do you take delight in the almighty? For 36 years, I didn't. I hardly gave God a second thought. I know some people put their faith in Jesus as a young person or, uh, or at least younger than I did at the age of 36. That's uh, 29 years ago now. Uh, but um, most people, and I was like them, just don't give God a second thought until sometimes something happens, like the death of my mother, like something. Sometimes there's an event in your life that you you all of a sudden you need some answers. Sometimes you just won't get on your knees and cry out to God. God, I want to know you. I've heard something about you. Is it true? I'm going to read the Bible and learn about you. And the people will not get on their knees and call on the Lord Jesus Christ unless they get knocked down on their knees. It is unfortunate, but many of us resist God until we get knocked down by the troubles of this life. Or maybe sometimes God uses that as a way of getting your attention. Verse 11, I will teach you regarding the hand, the power of God. I will conceal, I will not conceal what is with the Almighty, God's actual treatment of the wicked. Behold, all of you have seen it. Why then do you act vainly and foolishly, cherishing worthless concepts? This, which I'm about to explain, is the portion of a wicked man from God and the inheritance which tyrants and oppressors receive from the Almighty. Though his children are many, they are destined for the sword, and his descendants will not have sufficient bread. Those who survive him will be buried because of the plague, and their, window, their widows will not be able to weep. Just tragedy. The world is a tragic place. I've, I've had a hard time over the last few years, especially watching the decay of American society. I mean, I really long for the good old days. I believe that, you know, the fifties was a much better time than this new millennium. What America, how America has changed. Um, I've become quite cynical. And I, I find that uh, there's beauty. I mean, of course, I love God. I love Jesus, my Savior God. I love the saints, all the other believers. I love to have a fellowship. I love the Word of God, the study of the Scriptures. I love my family, my friends. I love creation, the beauty. There's so much to love. And yet it seems to be overwhelmed by the horrible things that I see in the world all the time. It is tragic what I've seen going on. Those who survive him will not be buried because of the plague and their widows will not be able to weep. Though he heaps up silver like dust and piles up clothing like clay, he may prepare it, but the just will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. He's talking about the people that are just, they're, they, they have a lot of gain, they have riches, but it's 
unjust. They're not, they're godless. They're wicked people and they get rich, but it's only temporary. It'll all be taken away either in this world or after, after this world is over, after they're, they go back into dust. Uh, they can't take it with them. They can't enjoy it. Verse 18, he builds his house like a spider's web, like a temporary hut, which a watchman makes. He lies down rich, but never will again. He opens his eyes and it is gone. It's just, a, as I said, uh, we're just pilgrims passing through. The scriptures say, this is not our true citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. And you probably, very few people even understand this, but if you study the scriptures, you'll find out that our citizenship in heaven is that the earth will, and the universe, the heavens, will be destroyed and recreated, and we will have heaven on earth as Adam and Eve did, but better, better. That will be our eternal place for those of us who trust Jesus. And that's what's important, not pursuing everything now that's temporary. Verse 20, terrors overtake him like a, a suddenly rising flood and windstorm steals him away in the night. The east wind lifts him up and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. For it will hurl thunderbolts of God's wrath at him unsparingly and without compassion. He flees in haste from its power. People will clap their hands at him to mock and ridicule him and hiss him out of his place. That's the godless people. Now, we talked about in a previous chapters how sometimes the, the godless, the wicked people, they seem to prosper, and, and, and you, you, we don't understand why. There is a law of reaping and sowing that we read about in the Scriptures. Jesus talked about it. Paul talked about it. The Old Testament talks about if you do good things, if you follow the commandments, you'll be blessed. And yet, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes people do the right things, and they raise their kids, their great parents, and their kids turn out to be criminals and just break their hearts. Sometimes this person eats perfectly, exercises perfectly, and then they get a, a, a terminal disease and die too young. But in the end, the wicked will suffer. And that's what this is really saying. Whether it's later on in their, in their life, it'll catch up with them, or if they make it through this life and they die, they can't take it with them. And then they get the judgment. And at the judgment, they're found lacking because they never trusted Jesus. They never received eternal life. And that gets me perfectly to the point I wanted to end on. And that is, uh, there's so much to be learned from all the scriptures. Um, I'm doing these live broadcasts nightly now, 7 p.m. Pacific time. I'm trying to do them for about an hour a night. And Job is only one topic. Um, we're, we're also studying uh, the book of Proverbs, the book of John, and the topic we're also studying is early church history. There's so much to learn. It's unending. Studying the Bible is inexhaustible. You'll never learn it all. You'll never know it all. It's just continuing to mine new nuggets, revelations from God. Um, but you can learn all of theology. And if you don't get the one thing that's most important right, it's all in vain. It means nothing. And the one thing you must get right is, what do you have to do if you want to go to heaven? You see, the world thinks you go to heaven as a reward for good behavior. But that's a lie from the devil. It started in the Garden of Eden, 
Eden. That's that's what basically the serpent told Adam and Eve. They said, you don't need the tree of life, which is a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He died on a tree, hanging on a tree, as a picture of the, the tree of life. God asked them to just have eat of the tree of life and not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But Satan said, I don't believe God. He says, if you eat the, the knowledge of good and evil, you'll die that day. That's not true. If, he just doesn't want you to eat it and then be like God and know good and evil. So Adam and Eve sinned by believing Satan instead of believing God. The very first sin was the sin of unbelief. They did not believe God. Trust in the tree of the tree of uh, uh, tree of life, Jesus Christ. Instead, they they decided to do it their own way. They would learn about good and evil, and they'd master it themselves instead of depending on God and trusting God. And that's, ever since then, it's been the same thing. All through history, and even most of the world today, they all believe in the same religion, the religion of personal merit, the religion that says, if I'm good enough, God will let me into heaven. But the Bible says that's man's way. It's not God's way. God's way is admit that you're in a helpless, hopeless situation that you cannot, through your own efforts, satisfy God. Because to satisfy God, you have to be perfect, sinless. And it's too late for you. You've already sinned. You're not sinless. And even if you try to sin less in your life, you've already sinned. You might have sinned dozens of times in your life, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe a hundred thousand sins in your life already. Bad things you've done, bad thoughts you've had, good things that you failed to do. All of these things are sins. Well, imagine except heaven has a sign that says above the gate says no sins allowed. And you have a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand sins all of you like warts. You look at that sign, it says, no sins allowed. Well, I've got a lot of sins on me. What if you only had one sin on you? You're the best person that, that well, we've ever ever heard of. But you got one sin. Well, you can't get in because no sin is allowed. God cannot have fellowship with you with sin. You can't be with God. So striving to get to heaven through your own efforts, thinking that if you just behave, God will reward you with heaven. That's that's a, that's all the religions of the world, and they're all false religions. What you need to understand is that you can't have any sin at all. You have to be perfect. You have to be sinless. And that's why God said, man who I love is in a hopeless situation. Scripture says, God commendeth his love toward us in that we in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You must understand that even though we were sinners, God loved us so much that he was willing to become a man named Jesus Christ and die for us to pay for our sins. The scriptures, that, that's, that's a demonstration of how much Jesus loves you. And the scripture says that we love him because he first loved us. And it's my hope that when you understand how much Jesus loves you, that he was willing to suffer and die to pay for your sins, isn't it natural that you would love him in return and trust him and rely on him? So that's what the Bible says that we must do. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe on him means we must depend on him. We must rely on him. Reject the idea that you can get into heaven through your own efforts. And if you strive enough, if you're good enough, you can do it. Reject that. 
repent. That means change your mind, no longer believe in your own ability, and say, I can't do it. I'm a failure. It's impossible. Jesus said, with man, they asked Jesus, well, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So accept the fact that with you, it is impossible for you to get saved through your own efforts. You don't get, heaven is not a reward for your good behavior. Forget that. And, and now embrace a new theology. A theology that God loves you so much, he became a man and he died for your sins. Your sins are paid for because what Jesus Christ did on that cross. And there's a word in the Bible called gospel. It's a Greek word and it means good news. The good news is that when he died for your sins, he was truly dead. But on the third day, he rose from the dead bodily. He walked for 400 days, bodily resurrected. He ate with the people, drank with them. They touched him. They spoke with him. He taught them. 500 people at one time. Peter, the apostles, the Lord's brother, James. All these people were eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Now, he said he would raise himself from the dead. He said that would be the sign he would give us to prove he is eternal God Almighty manifest in the flesh and also to prove that he does have power over life and death. He has the power to resurrect you and give you life everlasting in heaven. And he promises he will do that if you'll trust him and give up on trying to get there on your own. Just trust him instead. Will you do it? If you put your faith in Jesus completely right now, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven no matter what happens. No matter what, he guarantees it. That's a promise from Jesus. The Bible says he cannot lie. He cannot break a promise. So put your faith in Jesus now and, and jump for joy because you know you're going to go to heaven because of him. All right, uh, that's the end of the study for tonight. Um, join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific, for about an hour, and we'll continue this study and other topics too. Thank you for joining me, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.